Hey, I'm Andy. If you don't know me, it's probably because I'm not famous. But I did start a men's grooming company called Harry's. The idea for Harry's came out of a frustrating experience I had buying razor blades. Most brands were overpriced, overdesigned, and out of touch. At Harry's, our approach is simple. Here's our secret. We make sharp, durable blades and sell them at honest prices for as low as $2 each. We care about quality so much that we do some crazy things, like buy a world-class German blade factory. Obsessing over every detail means we're confident in offering a 100% quality guarantee. Millions of guys have already made the switch to Harry's, so thank you if you're one of them. And if you're not, we hope you give us a try with this special offer. Get a Harry starter set with a five-blade razor, weighted handle, shave gel, and a travel cover. All for just three bucks, plus free shipping. Just go to harrys.com and enter code FACE at checkout. That's harrys.com, code FACE. Enjoy! Mark Thompson. Make it kind. Get woke. God bless you. Get woke. Folks, MIP is now COVID free, meaning free to all subscribers as we navigate this pandemic. We're thinking about everyone and we've got to get through this together. So for a limited time, no fee to subscribe to make it plain on your favorite podcast app. Ladies and gentlemen, our latest segment that we call Win with Black Women. And that's exactly what we hope to do in less than two weeks. My guest this week is a fearless advocate for the most vulnerable in society. She spent the past 20 years as an attorney, advocate, and organizer for those forgotten and disenfranchised. She works to address systemic gaps in the law and social systems that leave women and children impoverished and unprotected. She spent her early years prosecuting child abuse and neglect for the city of New York. After years of helping victims, she found herself in an abusive relationship. And in June of 2012, she was nine months pregnant in a homeless shelter for women escaping domestic violence. By June of 2014, she rebuilt her life and was elected to the Maryland House of Delegates. As an elected official, she took on her own party to stand up for victims of domestic violence and spoke out against sexual harassment happening in the state house. During her time in the legislature, she wrote and passed more bills than any member of her chamber. She was also most recently the black engagement director for Pete for America, Mayor Pete's presidential campaign. She currently serves as director of Black Power. We got to hear about that title, the director of Black Power for Bowers Consulting. She still lives in Maryland and she's got five kids in Zoom school, I believe. So she, <laughs> this, we, so we talk about Superwoman. She's the director of Black Power. I've never known anybody with that title before. That's, I'm, I'm going to hear about that. And she's raising five kids, among other things. Angela Angel joins us on Make It Plain for Win With Black Women. Hey, Angela, how are you? I'm well, I'm well. Good morning. Thank you for having me on. Appreciate it. I mean, it it's, it's a pleasure. It's a pleasure to have you. So now tell us about this title, D- Director of Black Power. That's some kind of title. Thank you. It's um, it's amazing. It's an amazing position. Bowers Consulting, we do a lot of great work. We do a lot of the day-to-day management for the Black Lives Matter umbrella of organization, which includes Black Lives Global Network, as well as the Black Lives Grassroots Network. We do some great um, campaigns for different candidates. We actually just launched the Black Lives Matter PAC, 
So Black Lives Matter is going to be doing a lot of great things over the next coming weeks around the election. And so as director of Black Power, I deal with all of the different organizations. For me, it's really a dream. Um, it's a dream come true. I'm being able to combine both my legislative experience, my legal experience, and also what I've done on the ground as an advocate and as an organizer to move both organizations and individual candidates forward. And so it's, it's really exciting. And it's all centered around Black folks, unapologetically, unquestionably um, centered around moving Black folks in this country and abroad forward. So you mentioned what you're going to be doing in the next couple weeks. Tell us a bit more about that and how we're going to get this Black vote out and how you're going to stop Ice Cube <laughs> from his foolishness. Ice Cube is melting on its own, right? <laughs> like, I hope so. On its own. And, and really, you know, one of the things that we have to begin looking at is turning away from kind of this deification of people that are in entertainment um, who do not necessarily have the same understanding of what everyday Black people are going through, right? Um, and so when they're talking about looking at things for based on their bottom line and on other things, their bottom line is not like 80, 90% of other Black Americans, right? But one of the things that I say when I go into all of these rooms is that the Black population, not just at anywhere, is not a monolith. You have Black folks that are doing well, that have been well, actually for centuries, right? Whose family came out. You've got Black folks that have struggled for a long time. You have Black folks that are new to this country um, that we often forget, our Black immigrant population, right? right? And so one person doesn't speak for us. And so that's one of the things that we're doing for in, in the next coming weeks, even at Black Lives Matter and when I'm speaking with other folks, is you need to speak to the whole spectrum of right. the diaspora, right? You, right. Need to, you need to be engaging with folks who usually don't vote, who say things like, I've been poor under a democratic regime, I've been poor under a Republican regime, why is this different? And this is different, right? We have never had someone who is an unapologetic um, white supremacist, who has incited violence, who has supported violence, right? Who is creating programs very sneakily that you may not even realize that are, that are hitting us in some of the worst communities, right? That are taking away resources and very covertly diverting them so that you look up and it's like, where did, where did these programs go? You know, this is different. And, and having been in, you know, I've got good melanin. I'm much older than I look. Um, I've been doing campaigns for 20 years and I know, you know, one of the things I used to say in all at presidential cycles, I'm like, we always say this is the most presidential, this is the most important election, right? But this is, actually the first time we have had someone who is going after our people and who is going after them both publicly with his words and inciting violence and also privately with defunding programs and pushing things that are dangerous in our communities. And so this is the moment and what we're doing as organization, Black Lives Matter, NAACP, even you hear, we're speaking to folks and making sure they understand how serious this is and how important it is to get out the vote and that this is not like every other election where you can sit on the sidelines. You are and, in on, on the, you know, at the table or on the plate. Right. And it's also a critical moment too, isn't it, Angela? Uh, and first of all, you, 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 you do look very young. I have no idea how old you are. You look like you could be in Gen Z. You no, know, I'm not. <laughs> like me. Don't can we both look like? <laughs> oh, you just because I tell people I'm in Gen Z and it usually works. But anyway, uh, <laughs> but look, this is also a critical moment. Is that you? As you said, we've never had an an avowed white supremacist like this, but we've also never had a black woman on the ticket. And so, s some of our brother, some of my brother, I'm like, what y'all doing? Right. You know, it, it, this is we've not had this ever happen before. And so we need to get behind this sister and get behind these black women. I mean, that's that's a message that people need to embrace as well. Absolutely. Um, and it's something that, you know, you, I'm so glad that you as a black man has said that, right? Because unfortunately, we're seeing what I see in the field and what we're seeing is messaging that's the opposite. That is, right. that is hitting us against each other, you know, black men and black women. You know, 
we have to support Kamala on this pick, right? Like we have to support the opportunity for a black woman to be, you know, in the White House as vice president, you know, speaking for us, looking at, I, I'm an attorney, right? So I've watched Kamala for a while. You know, people don't, what she did in California, I remember when I watched her as she was doing, going against the banks, when everybody else was letting the bank fly, right? She was the one who led, who was like, no, you are going to pay us, you know, like a black woman, right? Oh, no, no, you're going to pay me what you owe me. You're going to pay me for the damage that you caused my community. And other people piled on to that suit and, and got, you know, and it ended up helping other states. But she was one of the folks that led that, you know, and so we will have that type of voice in the White House speaking for us. And I think it is it is critical. And it's something that we have to support and we have to get out there, like you said, and talk to the brothers. Don't let these folks, you know, divide us. They've been using this, these tactics of division and pitting us against each other for years. Do not fall for this. Right. We're well, better than and, and if we're actually aware, those of us who are and others trying to be aware, we know that mm -hmm. our community, since Trump has been in office and since he was a candidate the first time, has been disproportionately targeted for disinformation. Yes. So you, you put all that together with um, what you said earlier, and, and I just want to say, I mean, it's very eloquent what you said. I, I would hope too, Angela, that as um, the Black Power Director, um, that there might even be a little bit of history in your approach and dissemination of information. We've seen this before when our enemies will use popular people or entertainers mm -hmm. against the rest of us. I mean, to me, I just think it's a shame sometimes that we forget our history. If we really understood our history, then this Ice Cube thing wouldn't even be a thing. Oh yeah, we've seen it before. We've seen it throughout history. And entertainers are entertainers, right? I mean, that's what they're supposed to do. So this right here, it's still a form of, of entertainment. It's to our disadvantage, but it's entertaining those who would want to see us divided. And that's the bad part about it. Right. Absolutely. You know, and you look at Ice Cube and, and, you know, and then 50, you know, he dropped a, you know, an endorsement. And it's like, you know, when some, I said 50 is tro always trolls. <laughs> like, right. like, why is this, this shouldn't register? And when you start to talk about history, um, you know, people, one of the things that folks don't, that I think needs to be discussed more is also, it's not just about trying to get folks to vote for Trump, right? One of the things that the Republicans have historically done to the Black community that is very underlying and nefarious that people miss it is to just get enough information out there that we stay home. Because that's all that they need. That's right. They don't even need us to vote the other way. And that that's you know, they just need us to be like, well, you know, like with Hillary, you know, well, they're both bad and I don't really like her. Right. You know, in all of these instances, one of the things when I used to do politics back in the day, this is before the Supreme Court justices were on, was they would push, you know, a presidential candidate's a view on, say, abortion. Right. That was one of the things that Kerry and Gore um, I saw where they were always pushing that. At that point in time, there was no Supreme Court justice opening happening. So a presidential view on abortion, actually, because it's regulated mostly by states' rights, rights in the time that a presidential view comes into it is usually when it comes to a Supreme Court nomination. Mm -hmm. You know, but pushing that in the Black community actually pushes church voters and other folks that, you know, are against abortion. They're not going to vote Republican, but they'll stay home. Mm -hmm. And so this is a tactic that has been used. I always say Democrats very rarely lose to Republicans. It's not A versus B. It's always C, the couch, just like mine. We lose to the couch because people stay home. And that's one of the things that when we're talking about in our campaign is talking to folks, listen, you staying home is just as dangerous as in voting for Trump, right? Yeah. And, and talking about it historically, we lost because we didn't turn out. It's very, it's very simple. When Black folks turn out, the Democratic Party wins, we're able to push forward those types of agenda. When we stay home, they don't. So how powerful are you that somebody is just trying to get you to not participate? You know, as and, and, they're, and they're targeting Black men. They're targeting you to say, you don't really need, you know, don't support the sister, don't come out at all. 
Like, do you understand? And part of that is understanding the power you can take. Take your power and walk in it and make a decision and cast a ballot. And mm-hmm. cast that ballot for this Black woman. Cast this ballot for Joe Biden, for people that are going to advance your community. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Talk to our audience about being um, formerly with the Buttigieg campaign, who was an opponent uh, of both Biden and Harris, and now coming over to support the Biden-Harris ticket in the way that you are. Because some people, those who aren't in politics every day like you and me, may may not see how that's reconciled. Talk to us about uh, the Buttigieg campaign um, your experience with that, and then coming over to support the current ticket, if you would. Yeah, absolutely. So um, as the director of Black engagement for the, Bud- for the Buttigieg campaign, I also am from South Bend, Indiana, went to high school with Pete. Um, so a lot of people are like, how did you end up? And I'm like, I'm I'm a, I'm from, you know, I'm a little Black girl from Indiana. You know, I do, <laughs> at the end of the day, um, it's a, you know, I'm a Hoosier at heart. And um, it was, you know, so I, Pete was my hometown mayor. I've known him. Um, we, I've seen the growth that he did. So I was very proud to be on his campaign and to support and push forward. We created the Douglas plan. Um, if you look at a lot of the plans today, um, they are actually, they've taken pieces of what we created. You know, so it's something that I always, you know, I'm very proud of the work that we did there. Um, on the campaign, if you know, we actually, I was in North Carolina um, and we were full-fledged going ahead but Pete came to a realization. He actually called a meeting um, right before, right before um, we announced and went public, um, that you know he just felt that the way that this country was going and what we needed to do was to stop our campaign and to push forward for you know for Joe, right? And that's that's what came out. So Pete was one of the first to actually suspend his campaign, to come back out then a few days later and endorsed Joe Biden and ever since has been out there supporting him, doing fundraisers, pushing those who were Pete supporters um, to support Biden and just really talking about how we need to come together as Democrats. But one of the things that things that Pete did is he was able to reach into spaces where other Democrats were not necessarily going. And so he's gone back into those spaces and talked to folks about why you supported me and you understood that I brought change and you supported my ideals, this is how I think that same that same principles applies to Biden. And so, you know, he's been pushing it. We actually still have meetings, you know, amongst folks that are in the campaign or that were in the campaign. We've switched over to Win the Era, which is an organization that is helping to push Democratic candidates, you know, both at the top of the ticket and down ballot, because we haven't even gotten to how important your state and local races are that, you know, really decide the things that happen on your everyday life. And so it's been really great to see, you know, what he's done and what we're doing as, you know, former campaign staffers and as a part of the, we call it the Windy Era family. Yeah. Um, well, full disclosure, um, I'm. some of us may have contributed to Mayor Pete's decision to drop out because the last thing he did was when he was with us in Selma. And yeah. Selma was very hot and very hectic. And I felt bad because as soon as we got across that bridge, Mayor Pete pretty much announced he was dropping out. Uh, Amy Klobuchar, I said, Lord have mercy, did this experience of Selma make everybody drop? <laughs> so, um, but, but no. Um, um, I'm the Jesus moment, as they call it, right? <laughs> yeah, right. I, I think that, um, and it must have been a time for you because obviously, Mayor Pete had to deal with a lot of issues in and around the African-American community and even was criticized some, scrutinized more. Um, I I don't, in my recollection, the criticism never became so hostile. But as I observed it, and obviously I should give you some credit, I think he handled it well. Uh, and And I think honestly, objectively, he handled it as best he could under the circumstances. And he always, to me, to me, seemed um, um, willing um, to be educated and to listen. You know, a lot of candidates, as you know, Angela, are uneducable, don't listen, just I'm going to do what I want to do. But I never got that from Mayor Pete. And I knew a couple other people on the staff and, you know, he had been on the show. We've always had great 
conversations. He's been, um, I don't know why Fox News keeps letting him come on to be a surrogate because he wears them people out. Uh, you wear them out. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. But no, I think that was a very important campaign for a lot of reasons. That's that's one that I'll always consider to to even some campaigns that don't make it all the way to the end, they're still important and significant in the process yeah. of 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 raising the level of conversation and the bar across the board. But also know this, you and other sisters I know were spread out. Everybody couldn't work on the same campaign. So there were significant black women folks in positions of influence and authority spread throughout the campaign process. But I always got the impression, and tell me if I'm if this is true for you, that while you all were working on these other campaigns, <laughs> You were still kind of, I mean, really proud that Kamala was out there doing her thing. Am I right about that? Una- absolutely. <laughs> um, and it's funny, I thought you were going to ask, you know, about 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 the chat. <laughs> um, because we all, all, all of us, I mean, po- the political, the world politics is small and a lot of us know each other. So we supported each other as both staffers on these different campaigns because it's hard politics is hard in general I, I always say you know that's another show it's especially hard for black women yeah. um and so to see so we definitely we supported each other we so supported Kamala because what she's going through even how win with black women came about you know it was because we saw you know the attacks that were being lobbied at this black woman you know the, the same words ambitious, you know, the same words used to describe, you know, other folks were used as attacks upon her as, you know, and, and so we, we began and what was part of a of conversation and part of a lived experience, right? If you're a black woman in politics, you know, if you're a black woman in business in the world today, you know, you know how other people can be seen as, you know, enthusiastic in your view to think, mm-hmm. right? So, but, so to see someone you have work to get to the highest, you know, the second highest level, right? Running for president, which was the highest. And to see someone still facing these things, we just, we had to come behind her. We had to let, not to let her know, but also to let the world know we have her back mm. unequivocally. And when you mess with her, you mess with all of us. And if you have never had a black woman come for you, you can learn this cycle, what that means. Yes. <laughs> well, and come to think of it, it, it also shows how far we've come and why there's no um, comparison between the two parties. Yeah. African Americans in general, African American women in particular, are not empowered in one of the parties. But you have had so many Black women spread across so many campaigns this cycle. I don't remember, and and I mean in positions of authority, leadership positions, I don't remember a cycle when you've had that many Black women in that many positions of authority in that many campaigns at one primary season, you know? And and so that says a lot, um, that there were that many opportunities. And finally, that many black women given opportunities to go around. One of the, I'll tell you, one of the pet peeves I have is those who say, like you said, some of the things they say, well, I'm tired of the Democratic Party giving me this one, this choice of an old white man. So hold it. Some of y'all didn't support the black woman. Come on now. Or the black man in the race or the LGBTQ mayor. I mean, so it's not like Joe Biden was running on the phone. Or or the Latino brother. Kicking butt and taking names too. So I'm like, y'all wasn't doing that. So Joe Biden, because of that, and and let's be clear, Angela, the disinformation operation was run against Kamala from the time Steve Bannon said he saw her as a, the greatest threat of all. Mm-hmm. Remember, she was the favorite in a lot of ways. And then they started, you know, with the negative articles and the bed wench and the not progressive prosecutor. I mean, she was targeted from 
the very beginning. And I don't think that was just a dink. Oh, no, not at all. Not at all. It was definitely, you know, from the jump, you know, there were definitely some folks who felt like, well, how dare she? Right. Right. And and began the attacks, you know, immediately. Yeah. And 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 you're you're absolutely right. And and it's one of the things like it, it wasn't seen during for a lot of the other candidates. But I I say the same thing that you say when regards to when they say, Well, we've got two old white men and you know, it's about getting we as as folks of color, black folks especially, but all around, because you're right, we had you know, Asian American, we had a Latino, we had, you know, an LGBTQI candidate. You have to get involved in the primary process. You know, folks don't understand enough when, you know, even on your state and local level, get involved in your primary process. That is where the decisions are made um, about who's going to be at the ticket in November. And I'm always amazed at how many folks, you know, will miss a primary and then not understand why certain folks are on the ticket and not on the ticket right. in November. Right. Um, you know, but that's an education thing that, you know, one of the things that it's, it's something that we as, even as Democrats, as political operators, um, we have to begin doing as well. We have a responsibility. And part of it is because a lot of times C3 statuses, people say, well, we don't get involved in primary races. But it is something that we have to begin doing so that people can understand if you don't want, if you want to change the, the election in November, you have to get involved in April, May and June. Mm, yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's right. And and see who's out here um, rather than wait two weeks out and present an agenda, you know. But again, we know what that's really all about and, and what the exactly. real. Exactly. Is. Exactly. Yeah. You know. <laughs> and then wonder why folks can't meet with you because we're trying to run an election. <laughs> right, right, right. I mean, we, but we know, again, that's, like you said, that's to get us to stay home and right. to benefit. I mean, we can't, we can't be naive about that um, to benefit the other, the other side. How do you think the Biden-Harris campaign is doing? How do you think um, uh, the MVP, Madam Vice President, is doing? Um is in your view, if you were running this in terms of getting the black vote out, is she visible enough? Should she be more visible? What do you just want to, what are your thoughts on that? I definitely, I think the MVP campaign is definitely, especially because, you know, understanding that's a little outside of the direct, you know, party politics right. is definitely elevating, is bringing in conversations, is bringing people that you may not always see and getting to hear from them. Um, that's very effective. I, you know, we're this. We never ran a campaign in a pandemic, right? Mm -hmm. And so it's very difficult to judge. You know, visibility. Usually, we'll be talking about where you've gone to be in person. You know, now we're talking about TV time and buying internet spots. You know, I definitely respect the campaign and think that under these circumstances, they are doing a lot of great things, and I think they are definitely out there, you know, in the markets and trying to be in the areas where they need to be. You know, this is one of the things where, you know, it takes, you know, it takes a village, literally, right? It takes the C3s, the NAACPs, the Urban Leagues, you know, the Divine Nine that you see coming out and elevating this election. And they can't talk about a specific candidate, but they can just tell you to go vote, vote right? And it's like Black Lives Matter, we have a C3. So in that lane, lane we're telling folks go vote. Then it takes the C4s and the PACs who can actually tell you who to vote for and right. them elevating and being in places that the campaign can't be. You know, politics is a group sport, right? Like it is a team sport mm -hmm. and it is something that takes us all getting involved. I don't expect nor want the Democratic Party leading and in every space, right? Because they can't be. What we have to do and what, what you know, I'm never afraid to do is say, this is my lane, I got it. OK, <laughs> you know, and we need to have organizations um, operating that way. You know, you need to get your block. Whoever is watching, get your block. You know, you know, we have a thing. We say, does your man have a plan? Does you have you talk? Ladies, have you talked to your brothers, your sisters, your fathers, your man and ask them, do they have a vote plan? Do they know where they're going to vote? Have they asked for their ballot? Do they know where their early vote is? You know, if you don't, you can go to BlackLivesMatter.com and find that out. Right. Yeah. You know, make brothers. Talk, you know, do you have a plan? 
You know, you plan, you have to plan for everything in life for you to achieve something. You need to make a plan to vote. Then you need to turn to your brothers, your fathers, you know, ask your, ask your God, do you have a plan? Does your man have a plan to vote to get out there? And if we begin to do that, if we begin to look around, you know, talk to your neighbor, check your whole phone list, everybody that's a recent call, text them, do they have a plan to vote? Mm -hmm. Do they know where their stuff is? You know, if they need to know where their their latest, where their ballot box is, any of that, you can get it off of blacklivesmatter.com, right? You can find out all of this information. There are plenty of other organizations that you can go to, but we have to take care of each other, right? This yeah. village has to save ourselves. Yeah, yeah. Um, very well said. In, in fact, as, as I hear you talking about the different organizations and your title, Director of Black Power, um, one of the biggest proponents of two of the words in your title, uh, Black Power, was Kwame Ture, and I knew him. And what do you always talk about, Angela? Organization, organization, and organization. And that, it, that includes planning. And so when we talk about our organization, and also what you said, very important in terms of being on a team, see, that supersedes November 3rd. So yeah. it seems to me that even people complain about well, nothing's changed and I don't feel no difference. That's where that team sport comes into play so that the people we put in power, we hold accountable after November 3rd, correct? Absolutely. Absolutely. Yeah. And and so I, I try to say that to some of some of the brothers. Um, but I would give you an opportunity as, as an African-American woman, um, speak to black men for a moment. Um, I think obviously you understand too, uh, the despair, the lack of opportunity, even how it's decreasing in a pandemic, the police demic that's going on. So the disinformation bots exploit that. Um, so we're normally, when when a sister when you say to sisters, does your man have a plan? That can just happen. But in this climate, it's a little more difficult um, because of the targeting. But as a black woman, what would you say to black men, um, some whom uh, legitimately not only may not know a lot about the process, but who legitimately feel a level of despair and confusion and not really sure about what's in this for them? What would you say to those men absolutely um and you know i i have an older brother mm -hmm. um and my father was very heavily involved in politics um before he passed recently and um so for me i've always probably had most of my most intimate political discussions with black men um and have heard their hearts heard their pain um know how hard it is for them to see their brothers dying regularly on video, right? Know how difficult it is to feel in some ways powerless to protect your women, your family, your children, right? And and in this moment, it feels like, what can I do? Um, but I say that to say there's always just one step that we can do. And, you know, I'm a woman of faith, right? And so, you know, it, I believe, you know, faith is the size of a mustard seed, right? You just need to take one step and, and the things will begin to change. And you can say, you know, one of the things is when you pick up that ballot, we're not just talking about the president. When you pick up that ballot, it's going to have everyone from the president of the United States, who you're right, you may never meet, right? But it's going to have your school board representatives who are going to decide, you know, what happens to your babies. It is going to have oftentimes judges as well as county attorneys or state's attorneys who decide who's going to be prosecuted and who decide these cases and what's allowed into evidence when we're prosecuting a bad cop, right? Those things are on it. Your local legislature, your state and local legislators who understand those are the ones who actually write the laws that regulate police officers, right? All of your Congress, your Senate, all of those folks are on this ballot. And, and you have the opportunity, you have the power 
to make the decision on whether or not they keep their jobs. You know, you you have that. And so, you know, pick that, pick up that pen, you know, pick, turn in that ballot, go to that line, cast your vote, because this is the most powerful thing that you can do. It feels like it may not matter, right? It feels like, but so does sometimes filling out an application, right? So does sometimes just making the choice to eat better, to get up, to go for a walk, to do the small things. But we all know when the small, the small things add up in every situation in life, whether it's something as simple as taking care of your body, whether it's something as simple as saving money, whether it's something as simple as doing better on your job and getting raises, whether it's something as simple as filling out an application for a job, right? You sometimes have to fill out so many just to get the one job, but you've got to make the step. If you don't make the step, if you don't cast the ballot, you will not achieve anything. And once again, one of the things you have to understand is they know who votes. One of the things that when I train folks, please understand, every time you cast a vote, I can look up your entire voting history. And so when you need help from someone, when you are going to talk to an elected leader, they often will look up and see whether or not you are a voter. They decide resources in the community based on, well, this area votes. So I know if I don't do what they need, they will put me out of office. But if this area doesn't, then I don't necessarily have to worry about giving them all of the resources they need because they're not going to stand up and move me. Yeah. And, and, and that's, you know, that's the power that you have when you pass this ballot. Yeah. You all see, if you listen to Angela, you can see vividly how we can win with Black women. We cannot be separated Black men from Black women. Uh, we must hear our sisters. We must support them as they support us. You know, Black women supported Barack Obama. He's He could not have been president without the support of Black women and uh, us. So let's not abandon Black women at this moment when we have a Black woman on the ticket. And, and Angela's right. We got to be in this game. We cannot check out um, in that way. Um, so this is very, very important. My guest has been, I love this title, the Director of Black Power. I love it. Uh, <laughs> Angela Angel is, uh, has been our guest. It's women. So five children? Bless your heart. Five children. Yeah. One, and, and now I have them at every level. I've got a college, high school, middle school, elementary. Um, my daughter, my oldest is at Hampton University, my alma mater. So we're, yeah. It's, well, so it's are you a member of the, are, are you a member of the Divine Nine too? It's quiet. Right. <laughs> <laughs> are, are you a member of the Divine Nine too? I am not a member of the Divine Nine. Okay. So you didn't, you didn't play as at Hampton? <laughs> I did not play with Hampton. No, I love I love all of my divine nine sisters. I've got yeah. um, every side of the aisle, and my father was a proud member of Alpha um, Alpha Phi Alpha Sorority Fraternity Incorporated. I still have okay. a whole over there. All right, <laughs> wonderful, Angela Angel. So good uh, to talk to you. Thank you for all your hard work, and I know you're going to be very busy in this uh, in these concluding days. Try to bring this on home. Uh, we appreciate you, Angela. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Thank you. I appreciate you. Thank you for having me. All right. Thank you. God, you are our refuge. Send our ancestors to guard our doors. Cast out this virus from our communities and our bodies. Heal, bless, and protect everyone listening and their loved ones. Thank you for listening to Make It Plain and Get Woke. Remember to listen, like, and subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you get your podcasts. If all minds are clear, it has been Made Plain.